Today's episode is a doozy, because today we're covering one of the worst creatures ever, the infamous grave robber and phantom ghoul, Ed Gein. Here's your trigger warning for this episode. We're gonna be dealing with a lot of corpses, butchering, and sewing, if you catch my drift. Let's dig in. Edward Theodore Gian was born in Wisconsin on August 27, 1906. Ed Gian had a very controlling mother, along with a father who struggled with booze. Apparently, Ed's mom was fanatically religious and would warn her sons constantly about the sins of carnal lust and desire. Mom, I'm seven. I don't even know what that means. Ed's mom moved the family to a farm when he was nine, and by that point, Ed pretty much only left the farm when he went to school. Other than school, family time was all the time. When he wasn't at school, Ed spent most of his time doing chores on the farm. All the while, his mother preached to her boys about the immorality of the world, the evils of drinking, and her belief that all women, apart from herself, were naturally promiscuous and instruments of the devil. Oh man, how did she find out our secret? Every afternoon, Ed's mom forced her two sons to sit with her while she read to them from the Bible, usually selecting verses from the Old Testament and Book of Revelations. You know, anything concerning fatalities, destruction, and divine retribution were usually her favorites. In school, Ed was a shy guy, and his classmates and teachers all described him as having strange mannerisms. He would allegedly burst into laughter super randomly, almost as if he was laughing at his own jokes. And to add insult to injury, his mother would punish Eddie if he tried to make any friends, so he kept to himself and was friendless. What do you get when you cross an intelligent, antisocial boy with a traumatically religious mother and a booze-motivated father? A man so terrifying, he would inspire horror movie villains for decades to come. In 1940, Ed's dad passed from his addiction, so Ed and his older brother Henry started working odd jobs to support the fam bam. The brothers were considered generally reliable and honest by the neighborhood, and they both worked as handymen while Ed frequently babysat for neighbors, despite his sometimes odd and creepy behavior. Ed seemed to relate more easily with children than to other adults, though. But when Henry planned to move in with this divorced mom of two that he'd been dating, he started to worry about leaving Ed behind. He was also getting increasingly concerned about Ed's attachment to his mother. Ed was high-key obsessed with his mommy. And if this is starting to sound like Norman Bates from Psycho, that's because it is. Norman's character was entirely inspired by Gian the Obscene. Henry regularly badmouthed their mom around Ed who always seemed to be very shocked and hurt by these statements. A few years went by with Ed and Henry supporting the family, until one day in 1944, the brothers were burning brush on the property when the fire apparently got out of control. The local fire department arrived, and by the end of the day, the fire was extinguished, and Ed reported his brother missing. A search party gathered with lanterns and flashlights and searched for Henry, who they finally found lying face down on the property. It looked like he had been expired for some time, and it didn't look like he'd been burned in the fire. At first, they assumed the cause was something like heart failure, but it was later reported that Henry had bruises on his head. The police dismissed the possibility of foul play, but the county coroner later listed the official COD as asphyxiation. No official investigation or autopsy was ever performed, but once Ed's other crimes came to light, people weren't so certain that this was an accident after all. I wonder if he was inspired by the story of Cain and Abel that his mom read to him growing up. Like I mentioned before, Ed was obsessively devoted to his mother, and now it was just the two of them alone in the house. Ed's mom had a paralyzing stroke after Henry was gone, and Ed became even more devoted to taking care of her all himself. Once she had a second stroke, her health started to deteriorate quite rapidly after that, and she passed that same year in 1945. Ed was absolutely shattered. The author who wrote Ed Gein's biography about his life put it best when he said, he had lost his only friend and one true love, and he was absolutely alone in the world. Now, Ed lived completely alone on the 155-acre farm. 
Ed left his mother's room neat and untouched, while the rest of the house became a hot mess. He also boarded up rooms that had been used by his mom, including the upstairs floor, downstairs parlor, and a living room, leaving them like preserved, like a museum. Ed moved into a small room next to the kitchen during this time, while the rest of the house fell into squalor. During this time was when he also started to develop his interest in anatomy books, pulp magazines, and stories involving cannibalism and Nazi crimes. And during the next few years, a few residents from the general area would mysteriously disappear. Ed would finally be found out when a woman named Bernice Warden was reported missing from her hardware store in 1957. At the scene, the cash register was missing, and a trail of red splatters led out to the back of the store. A resident reported that they saw the store's truck had been driven out from the back of the building that morning. Bernice's son was a deputy sheriff, and he was immediately suspicious of the reclusive Guillen. He told the investigators that Ed had been at his mother's store the night before his mom's disappearance, and that he came back the next morning for a gallon of antifreeze. They found the receipt for the antifreeze dated the morning she disappeared, and that same day, Ed was caught and arrested at a local grocery store. The authorities sent to search the Guillen farm that night were greeted with an image that would haunt them for the rest of their lives. They found Bernice's body. Brace yourselves, it's bad. She was found headless, gutted, and hanging from the ceiling upside down. She'd been taken out by Ed's 22 caliber, and they described the way he had mutilated her body as if she was a deer he'd hunted. Further investigations found even more monstrosities in Ed Gian's house of horrors, some of which were organs in jars, bone fragments, noses, lips, and fingernails, and various items fashioned all from human skin, including a waste basket made from skin, armchair cushions, leggings from someone's legs, a mask from a woman's face, a lampshade from a face, and some skulls were being used as soup bowls. I obviously left a lot of other things out, but Wikipedia's got a pretty nice running list of all the nightmare fuel the investigators recovered from his home. After officials questioned Ed, he confessed to butchering Bernice, as well as another woman named Mary Hogan, who went missing three years earlier. He also confessed to digging up multiple corpses and taking their parts, you know, so he could practice making masks and suits out of their skin to wear at home. If you guys didn't already know, Ed Gein was a big inspiration for Buffalo Bill in The Silence of the Lambs. Along with exhuming corpses and fashioning his new clothing line, Ed was a straight up necro, you know what. Between 1947 and 1952, he made as many as 40 separate trips in the middle of the night to local graveyards to exhume recently buried bodies. He described being in a daze like state when he did it and visited three separate cemeteries for his trophies. On about 30 of those visits, he said he came out of the dazed state and ended up leaving the grave empty-handed. On other occasions, he dug up the graves of recently buried middle-aged women who he thought looked like his mom. Rumor has it, he would take the bodies home and tan their skins to make his pieces. Ed eventually admitted to stealing from nine graves at the local cemeteries, and even led the investigators to the locations. And get this, in order to prove that Ed Gian could have actually done it, the investigators went in and exhumed three different graves themselves. Ed was only five foot six and weighed 130 pounds soaking wet, so they weren't so sure it was physically possible, especially because he would go several nights in a row. The caskets themselves were inside these wooden boxes that were buried two feet below the ground in sandy soil. And Ed said he'd robbed the graves soon after the funerals when the graves were not yet completed. Sure enough, when the investigators exhumed the graves, they found them to be exactly as Ed said they would. Two of them were found empty with one having a crowbar in place of the body. Most of the body was gone from the third grave, but for some reason, Ed had returned rings and some body parts, which unfortunately confirmed he was telling the truth. Soon after his mother's death, Ed started to make his woman suit so that he could become his mother. 
and literally crawl into her skin because he loved and missed his mother that much. I really cherish my mother, but I have a picture of her hanging on my wall. Ed denied doing lewd acts with the bodies he exhumed and said that they smelled too bad. But psychologists still labeled him a necro because corpses and pieces of body parts still excited him. During the interrogation, Ed also admitted to butchering Mary Hogan, whose head they found in the house, but he said he couldn't remember any details of what happened. A 16-year-old kid who was friends with Ed told authorities that he kept shrunken heads in his house from the Philippines that were from his cousin who served there in World War II. Ed told him they were relics. But when the police investigated the heads, they discovered that these were actually the masks Gian had made himself from peeling the faces off of corpses. Ed was also considered a suspect in several other unsolved cases, including the disappearance of a babysitter in Wisconsin. Authorities attempted to connect him to other murders and disappearances from recent years, but they could never prove it. Ed's lawyer decided to enter a not guilty plea by reason of insanity, and Ed was found unfit to stand trial. He was sent to a state mental hospital where he worked as a carpenter's assistant and a medical center aide. 10 years after being committed to the institution, Ed was finally determined fit to stand trial. He was found guilty of the crimes against Barbara Warden and was yeeted right back to the state hospital. Ed became a fascinating person to study for psychologists who up until this point thought men like Ed were the works of fiction. They were morbidly captivated by his terrifying hobbies and wanted to know why. And I would personally like to know why, God? Ed had explained to psychologists that when he was a child, he often wondered what it would be like to be a woman, and it sounded like it became a fixation for him. He thought that by making his own epidermis onesie, he could feel what it would be like to be a woman. The Gian house and property was appraised, and his possessions were scheduled to be auctioned off. It was also rumored that the house and the land it stood on might become a tourist attraction. And all of us are probably descendants of the tourists who showed up to look at his property. But early one morning in 1958, the house was destroyed by fire. Arson was suspected, but the cause of the fire was never officially determined. When the institutionalized Ed found out about the fire, he just shrugged and said, just as well. Even though he only ever admitted to actually butchering two women, experts believe he was most likely responsible for many more, but we will never know for sure. <sighs> he truly is the worst. Thanks for watching.